Hi, I'm Matt Chandler here, pastor of the Village Church. Just want to thank you for streaming uh, this sermon uh, on your device. Uh, I, I wanted to, just before we get going here, uh, just lay before you a deep conviction we have that this video sermon uh, that we've prayed really stirs up your affections for Jesus and shapes you and molds you into the image uh, of the Son um, would just be supplemental to your relationship with the Lord and in no way would replace the church you should be plugged into or the pastor that God has put over your life to shepherd and care for your soul. And so please uh, enjoy the next hour or so uh, of this message. We have prayed that God would use it in a profound way in your life. Blessings. Well, Happy New Year. How are you? I've had a lot of people ask, so let me just answer it. I have no idea why I'm wearing a jacket. I just put one on today, so it wasn't like a New Year's resolution. It wasn't dressed like a grown-up year or anything like that. I just threw the jacket on. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab those. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3 for the first part uh, of our time together. If you don't have a Bible, it uh, should be a hardback black one somewhere around you. You don't own one. Uh, that's our gift to you. Um, oh, for the last six to eight years, uh, we've used the month of January the same way. We've, we've tackled um, three fairly large topics. Uh, those topics are always the same. We haven't varied from those topics. We, we've looked at racial reconciliation. We tend to do that the weekend uh, before Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. Um, and then we've tackled uh, the, the idea of life and what life is and when life begins and how the Christian ought to consider life. And then uh, lastly, we've looked at um, the unreached peoples or what the Bible would call uh, the nations that all over the world there are men and women uh, who do not know uh, about about the mercy and grace afforded to them in Jesus Christ, and, and yet we see in the scriptures that, that Christ did not die uh, for those who might be saved, but for those who will be saved. And so we uh, pray, we send, we go, and we consider um, the unreached in the world. So we've done that every year. We always kind of frame it uh, around uh, the, the, the idea of prayer. Uh, these things are the size and scope uh, of which, without the power of God moving in profound ways, it's going to be a dance of three steps forward, four steps back for our lifetime. And so we want to humble ourselves uh, and be desperate and dependent upon God to work and move for the glory of his name and our good. And so uh, we've approached that in various ways for the last six to eight years. Here's what I want to do in my time together today um, to, to kickstart this month. I, I want to give um, two sermonettes, each about eight to ten minutes. So I'm going to give an eight to ten minute sermonette on my my hopes for the Village Church in 2016. Then we're just going to stop and we're going to spend about eight to ten minutes just praying together. And then I want to give uh, an eight to ten minute sermonette on uh, really the, the lenses by which we will see and approach those three topics over the course of the rest of the month. And then we'll stop and we'll pray again. Now, I know that's risky. Uh, and what I mean by risky is that I know some of you are not believers in Christ, uh, and so you've come because a friend or a coworker or a family member has coaxed you into being here, and here I am giving 20 minutes of our service over to just prayer. So, so maybe I can help you by framing it this way. Uh, what you'll witness when you watch us pray as the people of God is um, men and women who are well aware of their imperfections. We are well aware of our hypocrisies. We are well aware of our shortcomings. And yet we earnestly and completely believe that God hears us and wants to hear from us and that when we pray, it pleases the heart of God. When we consider the God of the Bible, he is unlike any earthly father ever. In fact, Jesus um, in the gospel gives the story of the persistent widow. He's trying to convince the people of God that God wants to be pestered by his children. 
Right? I've oftentimes joked um, that if my dad ever said, ask me one more time here, that was a threat. It wasn't an invitation to actually ask him one more time. And, and yet the God of the Bible says, pester me, bother me, follow me around the house without stopping talking. Right? I want you to keep coming to me. I want you to keep bothering me. I want you to cry out to me, not because he finally gives in, but because it changes our heart to ask. And so if you're not a Christian, what you see when we pray is our understanding that in our brokenness, in our weariness, in our undoneness, our God still hears us. And if you need further evidence to feel safer here at the village, let, let, me, let me just do this. If you are a Christian, um, how many of you who are Christians would go, I can look back on the last week, I can look back on the last two weeks, and I can see um, sinfulness and brokenness present in my life. Okay, so that, that's 100%. 100% of the Christians just raise their hand, or they didn't, and they're liars, and that also proves my point, right? Uh, and so yet, what we believe as Christians and what the Word of God teaches is that these hypocrites that you know and, and these inconsistent followers of Christ that you know are heard by their God, loved by their God, and delighted in their God, despite maybe their, their um, difficulty in prayer itself. And, and so that's what you'll witness. And, and then I want to add this caveat to this is also dangerous because many of us are, are what could be called cultural Christians. You don't really have a relationship with God, but, but you would self-identify as a Christian, maybe because uh, your parents were Christians, or maybe because you're a conservative, or maybe your parents duped you with the old, do you want to come to heaven with us or burn in hell forever question? And you signed on to heaven and were baptized when you were four or something. Uh, and so you would self-identify with as a Christian, but you have no relationship with Christ. Christ. And so that's going to make things awkward because I'm about to sit you down with a stranger, right? And so prayer will feel awkward because you have no real relationship with Christ, but you would self-identify as a Christian. And so um, cultural Christians tend to want to be entertained. They, they, they tend to want me to dance for them. And I don't mean literally because no one would want that. But I mean, they want me to be funny and energetic and insightful and, and witty. And, and really, when all said and done... I want you, if you find yourself bored or not interested, I want you, if you identify as a Christian, for you to enter into the wrestle of why that would be if you really are a believer in Christ. Like, why would you not want to have a conversation with your Savior? Why would you not want to engage with the living God? And so with that said, let me start with my hopes for the Village Church in 2016. So if you have your Bibles, we're in Ephesians uh, chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 14. Uh, and just to honor uh, our God who speaks to us in his word, will you stand uh, as I read Ephesians chapter 3, 14 through 19 for us? For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. May God bless the reading of his word. You can have a seat. Uh, I have been glued to this text. I, I have had my hooks into this text. I have read it and meditated upon it and wrestled with it uh, since the first week of June. And so I have daily dove into this text for the good of my own soul. So my experience in my relationship with Christ is over the last 20 something years, God has actively been deconstructing me and reconstructing me. Amen. Like God breaks me down and builds me back. He breaks me apart and puts me back together that, that in my highs and in my lows and the things he enables me to see that, that he 
um, deconstructs me and then he reconstructs me again. And this past summer, the month of June was a month of deconstruction. I went up uh, and saw uh, a guy who's probably my spiritual mentor, just kind of helps me navigate the depths of my heart. There's much in me that is confusing to me. I don't know if you can relate to that or not. Maybe you just know exactly who you are. I, I get jostled easy about things inside of me. Uh, I'm from a broken place. Uh, God has for 22 years been putting me back together. And to do that, he's had to break some things in order to set them right. And so June was one of those months for me. And I laid hold of this text and I wrestled with God through this text. In this text, uh, I see the prayers I have prayed for myself. And this really um, kind of mysterious, cool thing has happened as I've been uh, the pastor of this church for 13 years. Longest I've ever lived anywhere in my life now is this place. And, and what's happened is my prayers and hopes for myself have also become my prayers and hopes for us. So, so that the Lord has um, mysteriously and beautifully kind of knit us together. So I can't hardly hope for myself without including you in that. Um, and so what I thought I would do is just point out a couple of things uh, in this text that your pastor wants for his own soul. Uh, and then I want to lead us in across all campuses, Plano, uh, Fort Worth, Dallas, uh, across the, the rest of our campus. I want to lead us into a time of prayer for us individually and then us corporately as the village church based on what we see in this text. And so um, here's, here's the first kind of sentence in the text that I've prayed for for myself and I want us to pray for us. The, the, the Apostle Paul writes to the Christians at the church in Ephesus that they may be strengthened with power through the Spirit of God in their inner being. Now, uh, as Westerners and Americans, we don't tend to consider the inner being very often. We are very rationalistic, very intellectual. We'll talk about the intellect here in a minute. Nothing wrong with the intellect. God would have you steward your intellect well, and yet um, we're not primarily thinkers. We're primarily lovers. There's something in us. There is an invisible code that our lives run on that this is operating system that's underneath everything. It drives how we think. It drives how we interact. It drives all these. This is the inner man. The inner being is the integration of mind, body, and soul. It's the spirit. And the apostle Paul says that we need strength by the Holy Spirit in the inner being as God deconstructs us and reconstructs us. So I've been praying that for myself. I have not yet learned to love the seasons of deconstruction. In fact, I still um, hate them, even though I know what they're accomplishing. Uh, I know that every time the Lord has deconstructed me, he has reconstructed something more beautiful, something that can hold more of his grace, something that understands more the full beauty of who he is. And yet every time the, the foundation and walls of my life began to creak, I brace and, and cling to a verse like this in the hopes that, that I'll, I'll make it through. I need strength in my inner being as God deconstructs and reconstructs me. I'm not yet who I know I one day will be. I'm hungry for that strength in my inner being. The next part of this text talks about being rooted and grounded in love. I want to be rooted and grounded in love. I, I want the default motivation of my heart to be love, not to be other pursuits or other motivations. I, I need um, more rooted love. I, I feel like oftentimes love as a driver of my life is, is much like a, a weed in shallow ground rather than an oak tree beside streams of, of water. Right? I, I want deep roots. I want love a, as the grounding agent of my life to be nearly impossible to, to uproot. I want the Spirit of God to do that. I can't simply decide to do that. I can decide to act loving, right? But in some sense, that's slavery. I want to actually be rooted and grounded in love, to be shaped and molded by the love of Christ. And then this third prayer, I want to create a caveat, lest you think your pastor's lost his mind. He says in verse 19, and this is the, this is, I mean, I've just clung so tightly to this phrase. In verse 19, he says, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. The Apostle Paul, who wrote Romans, the Mount Everest of doctrinal books, even the Bible says Paul's writings are hard to understand. Have you ever thought about that? 
Like in first Peter, Peter's writing to some church and said, I, I hear you're reading Paul. He's difficult to read like that. The Bible says that the Bible's hard. That's awesome. And, and yet Paul would say to the church at Ephesus, I pray that you would experience Christ in a way that supersedes your knowledge. So let me say it to, to you this way, just as means of a confession, your pastor's mind is 200 miles ahead of his heart. Your pastor's mind is 200 miles ahead of his heart. That the integration between heart and mind, that that gap is too big. And I'm asking the Spirit of God to close that gap because Paul says, I want you to experience the love of Christ in such a way that it surpasses your knowledge, that you wouldn't even know what was going on, that your sense and experience of the living Christ would be so profound that you wouldn't have a grid for it. Like, I'm hungry for that for me. I'm hungry for that for you. Unless you think I'm getting all mystical and weird, let, let me be really honest. The, the village church will be a place that loves and preaches ferociously and fearlessly the word of God. We are rooted in the scriptures, unafraid of what the scriptures teach, never want to vary from them in any way. In fact, after this series, we'll get into the gospel of John and, and walk through the seven I am statements that Jesus makes in the gospel of John. From there, we'll get into the Psalms this summer, specifically the Psalms of Ascent. And then starting the fall, we'll dive into what might just be a year or two in the book of Exodus. So we love the word of God. We've started the Village Church Institutes here where we're training doctrinally informed disciples of Jesus Christ. And, and yet in the midst of all of that, you must know that intellectual assent does not equal a transformed heart. What I'm hungry for for me is the gap between my head and my heart to close. And what I'm hungry for for you is that you might experience the love of Christ in such a way this year that it surpasses knowledge, that it's disorienting and discombobulating as the love of Christ sweeps you downstream. And then lastly, that, that you've got this prayer um, that we would be filled with all the fullness of God. Nothing about all the fullness of God. That, that Greek word there, all, if you look it up, means all. Like all of it, which is why they translated it that way into English, right? That all the fullness of God would be, we'd be filled with all of it. So I'm hungry for that. And, and I'm aware that, that part of what's happening in my deconstruction and reconstruction is God creating space for more of his fullness, which is why we need to learn to love those seasons in which we're being deconstructed, right? And so he, here's what I want us to do. I want to set aside some time, regardless uh, of campus, we're going to do this together as a church, for you to pray for you and for you to pray for us as a church. Because here's the reality about these four things. Um, at the end of 2016, we could pray these same things for 2017. That the Lord might answer these in profound ways this year and still there'll be all this room to grow into. What these kind of prayers create is a hunger and thirst for righteousness. And those are, those are good things because Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. These are the type of prayers that link us up to our brother David in the Psalms that says, as the deer pants for water, so my soul longs for you. It yearns for you. In Psalm 27, one thing I ask and all that I seek is to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. These are prayers that sow into our lives divine discontentment and insatiable thirst for more of God. And I'm hungry for that for me and you. And so I just want to lead us in a time of prayer. Again, if you're not a Christian or um, you're a cultural Christian, you, you identify as a Christian, but there's no relationship. I understand this can be awkward. If you're not a believer, uh, maybe just pray prayers uh, of belief. Ask God that if he's real, he would show you that he's real, that he would convince your heart, that he would show your mind. If you're nominal, that you would really wrestle with the fact uh, at why this bothers you to stop and actually have a conversation with your Savior and Creator. So I'm going to put the prayer points on the stage and we'll just begin to pray. You for you, 
and you for us as a church. And so here's uh, the first prayer point right from the scriptures. I want us to pray that we might be strengthened with power through his spirit in our inner being. If I could simplify that, let's ask for there to be a profound of work, profound work of God in our hearts this year and in the life of the village church. I'm just going to give it to you now to pray for yourself. I'm going to be praying also. If you don't know how to pray, don't know what to pray, just pray the words on the screen. I promise you, the words on the screen are from the Bible. You can pray the Bible back to God. It's his words. It's lovingly saying, you've promised this. I'm claiming this promise. I want this promise. And so you pray for you. Ask to be strengthened with power through his spirit. Ask for there to be a profound work of God in your life this year, as well as the life of our church. Maybe you know some specific places where you want to see that profound work occur. Next, would you begin to pray for you that you would be rooted and grounded in love? Ask that your heart would be shaped and molded by the love of Christ and then pray that same prayer for our church. That our church, the people of the village church would be rooted, grounded in love. Would you begin to pray that you would know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge? Would you ask to experience the love of Christ this year? That the gap between your head and heart would shrink. That the one-liner, bumper-sticker theology that exists in your mind would be experienced in the depths of your soul? Would you ask for that for you? Would you ask for that for our church? And then lastly, to close out this first block of prayer, will you just stand with me? Even if Plano 
Dallas, Fort Worth. Will you go ahead and just stand? We're going to stand together as a church across uh, the Metroplex. And I know what I'll ask you to do next might be weird for some of you or freak out others of you, but it's just a, a simple act of prayer, uh, of faith as we pray this last part. Will you just uh, cup your hands in front of you? And I know some of our Pentecostals are like about time and some of our Baptists are like, this is freaking me out. All right. And so just as a, just as an act of faith, would you just cup your hands and I'm going to pray for us that we might be filled with all the fullness of God and our open hands aren't magical or anything like that. They're just a sign of faith and longing to be filled with all the fullness of God. So let me pray for us now. Father, I thank you that you hear us, that our prayers are pleasing to you that despite our undoneness, despite our hypocrisy, despite our shortcomings, we can boldly approach your throne of grace with confidence. I thank you that there is more occurring in our humbly asking you to move than in all of our efforts. So we ask you now, to fill us as your individual sons and daughters and fill us as a corporate body of faith, a covenant community, a family of faith in this given location, in this given time with the fullness of what we can handle. I thank you for the deconstruction that's occurred and the reconstruction that's occurred, hoping that that reconstruction, believing that that reconstruction simply will house more of your fullness. So where 15 was a year of brokenness and and hurt and loss, I pray that as you reconstruct us, we'll experience more of your fullness, more of your pleasure, more of the beauty that is belonging to you. And it's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen. And why don't you have a seat? The second sermonette I want to address uh, begins to set us up for the next couple of weeks. So if you have your Bibles, go over to Genesis chapter 1. That's a real easy one. Uh, So it should be the first page or two in your Bible. While you're turning there, I I want to uh, point out something really quickly. In the ancient Near East, the ruling nations of the day had specific creation narratives that they embraced, uh, uh, stories where, where they got where the universe came from and where humankind came from. So if we look back upon the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Persians, and as we look back on the ancient Near East and those nations that ruled the known world at that time, they all shared similar creation narratives. And, and the creation story that they ascribed to were, were that there um, are multiple gods that somehow uh, a war broke out in the heavenlies and, and via violence, conflict, and power, the universe began to exist and humankind began to exist. And then as the dust settled, those gods divvied up creation and they were the god of that aspect of creation or they were the god of that nation. They were the god of this people group. And so the worldview was that the universe and humankind began to exist out of power, violence, and ultimate dominion. Now, what this did to the view of of humankind was it put the value of mankind on a sliding scale. Depending on your color, your class, your culture, or your capacity, your worth was determined by those four C's. So if you were a specific color or class, you were a specific um, culture or capacity, you might be of ultimate worth, equal to others, or you might be worth less than a goat or a cow. This is part of what made the ancient Near East such a brutal and violent place, their understanding of where we all came from. And yet, in the middle of the ancient Near East, this small group, this chosen nation, this this group of God's elect called the Hebrews, they they had a, a creation narrative of their own. And because of what they believed about the origin of the universe and the origin of humankind, they they were 
awkwardly freakish in the ancient Near East that, that the idea of a monotheistic um, reign and rule of one God and the intrinsic value of every human person regardless of class, color, culture, and capacity um, was it would have seemed as foolish as a lot of things seem to non-believers today about us. And so I want to read to you uh, the creation narrative in Judeo-Christian thought and life, um, how God created the world and created mankind. And, and then I want to lay before you um, how that should change how you see yourself and how that should change how you see others. And let that be the framework for where we're going the next three weeks. In Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 26, the Word of God says this. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So let me stop there. Right away, you see what makes us awkward and freakish in regards to the ancient Near East. The ancient Near East said the origin of the universe is power, violence, and dominion. And the Christian worldview, the way God created the world, is actually out of the overflow of community, love, and joy. Right? So if you were here when we studied the Apostles' Creed, we talked at length about how our God is triune, three in one. Right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So when you're reading Genesis 1 and the Bible says, and God said, let us... He, he's not, it's not saying that God had like some, some angels there. He's like, hey guys, here's what we're going to do today. But rather, out of the overflow of loving community, God paints on the canvas of creation the beauty and worth of his own glory. So that the origin of the universe is not power and violence and dominion, but community, joy, and harmony. And then, uh, I mean, what, what would have really thrown people off is, is that in this text, you see that God made man in his own image, that humankind becomes the crown jewel in all of God's creation, that we, although not the most powerful mammal, not the fastest mammal, not, right, like there are, there are all sorts of mammals that are faster than we are, um, can, can, can um, do things that we cannot do, and yet the Bible says, no, 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 it is mankind alone humankind alone that have been made in the image of God. And since humankind has been made in the image of God, then all humans everywhere, regardless of capacity, regardless of color, regardless of culture, and regardless of class are intrinsically valuable because they and they alone have been made in the image of God of God. And so when you get that, when you understand that, it changes how you see yourself. Here's what I mean by that. When you understand that you have been made in the image of God, you will not treat yourself cheaply. You will not treat yourself cheaply. When, when I'm talking about that, I'm, I'm not talking up here in the ethereal spiritual clouds. I'm, I'm saying you won't treat yourself cheaply. You, you'll, you'll grow your mind. You will increase your intellect when you know you've been made in the image of God. Now, I'm not trying to put a weight on you that's not meant to be put on you. How many of you would just say, I know people that are smarter than I am, and they're always going to be smarter than I am? Right? Yeah. Okay. Everyone but maybe Doug Stanley, our director of operations, just raised their hands. He's like, I'm going to need to see some data. I'm not sure I'm willing to sign off on that just yet, right? <laughs> Biomedical engineering, summa cum laude, just uh, a freak. But most of us are around people that are like, yeah, I could give all my days to study and thinking, and that dude is just naturally smarter than I am. And so uh, I'm not saying that, that you are to be the intellect of another, but rather that you should be serious about the life of your mind because it acknowledges that we've been made in the image of God and God has plans and purposes for our lives. So we want to be, we want to be the most sanctified version of us possible. 
So we grow in our mind. We grow in our intellect, not to show off, not to solve the world's problems. If man's mind could solve the world's problems, we had already done it. Right? Even um, the Greeks had myths about why every time man fixes a problem, he creates other problems with the fix of that problem. Right? Prometheus, you can look up and study the, the story of Prometheus, how he gave man fire and the Zeus tied him to a rock and had a vulture come eat out his liver every day and then have the liver grow back so that, right? You know what the Greeks are trying to explain? The fact that human beings can't fix themselves and the more we try to fix things, we might fix this problem, but we create seven others. Right? That's what happens in us. But we grow in our minds, not because we'll solve any problems, but rather because God has called us, has purposes for us, so we want to become the most sanctified version of us possibly, possible. When we understand the Imago Dei, we take good care of our bodies. Now, I categorically reject, categorically reject our culture's view of the sexy body that we must all strive for. One, it's near impossible without devoting yourself um, to surgical enhancement and illegal drugs, right? It, it's, it, I mean, the, the, the kind of spend all day in the gym, and I'm, I'm just so categorically against that nonsense, but I do want to watch what I eat and I want to take good care of my body because I don't know what the Lord's leading me into. I don't want to be prepared for it, whatever it is. I believe that I've been called as a Christian, set apart as a Christian, and that God wants to use me and I want to have adequate energy for that. I want to have adequate mind space for that. And I want a physical body that will enable me by the grace of God to fulfill the calling God has for me in Christ. So I eat well and go to the gym, not, not, to, not to bench press 315 because I just can't imagine what's going to happen to me during the week that's going to require that. <laughs> right? Something, oh, I'm ready for this one, right? I just don't know what's going to require me at any given moment to squat thrust 285 pounds. So, so those are the, the kind of goals I'm trying to set as I uh, work out consistently. I, I want to be in good shape. I want to be ready for whatever the Lord would call me to. We take good care of our bodies. And when we understand the Imago Dei, we take um, good care and we pay attention to our souls. So we're paying attention to our minds, we're paying attention um, to our bodies, and we're paying attention to our souls where there is lust and anger and anxiety and fear and rage flowing through us. We understand, feel, sense, understand that those are clogged arteries and for robust health and vitality, those things must be dealt with. So we seek counsel, we um, pray, we, we let others into those clogged arteries so that they might help and walk alongside of us. This is called integration, that we are full people. We have a mind, we have a heart, we have a soul, we have a body, and all of them coming together in health is what God has for us in Jesus Christ. The Imago Dei means we don't treat ourselves cheaply, but it doesn't just change how we see ourselves. It changes how we see others. Now, I wrote this sentence. I wanted to make sure that I read it. Life, especially human life, regardless of culture class, color, or capacity is to be considered with the utmost seriousness. Life, especially human life, regardless of culture, class, color, or capacity is to be considered with the utmost seriousness, right? What I mean by that is I must take very special care not to believe that there are certain lives that are less valuable than other lives. All of us have been made in the image of God and therefore are due respect, honor, and seriousness. Understanding the Imago Dei helps me see myself and in knowing myself, help me see others differently. Like I stand up here today, a 41 year old man who didn't just spontaneously appear backstage right before I came out uh, to preach this to you. I am what you see before you today um, is the result of 41 years of wins and losses, wounds and healings, right? Um, frustrations and hopes. Um, that 
on, on and on I could go. I have been shaped by relationships and experiences, hurts and hangups and losses and, and education and all of that has shaped me and put me up here. I am a result of my yesterdays. You are your result of your yesterdays. You did not spontaneously blow up here today as you are. There have been things that have happened, things that you have believed, things that others have done, and things you have done to yourself that have brought you in here as you are. We behave the way we behave for very specific reasons. And so the Knowing that about me, knowing that about you, knowing that about others shapes how we see them. So the guy that's consistently rude and crusty and a jerk, like I'm not trying to excuse his behavior, but in understanding the Imago Dei helps us understand that some things have happened to that poor soul to get him to that point. And understanding the Imago Dei creates empathy and creates the ability for me to respond to that type of nonsense with kindness because the Bible tells us that a kind word turns away wrath. That as a man who hates himself, acts pompous and ridiculous and rude in order to make you hate him also, that you responding with kindness to that begins to soothe deep places and confuse and maybe even incite initially. And then lastly, not only does it affect how we see ourselves and affect how we see others, we also acknowledge as we see others the differences in other culture, colors, capacities, and classes. But we are slow, we are slow to make accusations and take a posture instead of humility, seeking to understand others as we know our own culture, color, capacity, and class are not ultimate, but one of many of God's panorama of beautiful design. So let me, maybe I'll just make it real simple. That was too wordy. Um, I'm white. All of them, I'm just a white guy. Both my parents, white. Both their parents, white. We just keep going back. Just a lot of whiteness in my family, right? If you, basically, we're, we're much. You, you take a little German, a little Anglo, all the Anglos, you put them in, you shake them up, and you dump them out. That's the Chandler Walker clan. That's my family. I'm white. I am uh, middle class. And, and for a pastor being middle class, is, is actually, that's pretty good. It means I've done well. Uh, and so I'm white, I'm middle class, I am educated, I, I, am, I have moved the ball farther than, than my parents were able to in, in how the world judges success. I live in a larger house, I drive nicer cars, I, like I've moved the ball forward in, in that kind of thinking, right? All that is true, and yet, for me, for me to demand and believe that if others would just be more like me, the world would be a better place is wicked, arrogant, and perverse. And it's a misunderstanding of what it means to be made in the image of God and that all men and women are made in the image of God. And so what that means is I will never see myself as being ultimate, but rather one culture, one color, one class with certain capacities as a piece of what God is doing overall. That immediately creates in me a gap of ignorance, right? It means that it's going to be hard for me to understand people who don't share those things with me, right? I mean, isn't that a, a no-brainer? I mean, it just means I don't know what it's like to be a different culture. I don't. My little sister lives in Asia. I've been over there. It's confusing. I don't get it. They don't get me, right? I, I mean, how can I? I'm an Anglo-American and they're Taiwanese Asians, right? I mean, we're, we're just different. We've grown up different. We've got different languages. We've got different cultures. We're different colors. We've got different backgrounds and different experiences. This creates a humility. How, I, how can I judge them? I can't. I haven't been there and I certainly aren't going to demand that they be like me. You know what I was thinking about this country, as beautiful as it is, that if you guys could just be more like me, this place would be far more awesome. Here, here, just be white. Work as hard as I work. Take advantage of the opportunities I took advantage of because all mankind has those opportunities. See, that's just a complete lie. 
If you would just do these things, you would enjoy the success that I enjoyed, and the problems of the world would melt away. That is an arrogant, evil, wicked way of thinking. It is ethnocentric, and it elevates your class, your culture, and your capacity, your color to uppermost. Like God's, when, when all said and done, you're what pleases God, your color, your class, your class. And, and I think everyone's guilty of this. This is not just an Anglo issue. I think everyone is guilty of this. Understanding the Imago Dei creates in me an understanding that I'm never embarrassed about who I am. God made me who I am. He has blessed me with certain things and, and he's created hurdles for my good for me. It does mean, however, that I will often need to shut my mouth, take off my jacket and put on another man's jacket to try to understand. And even when I put on his jacket, I might not be able to understand, but with a great deal of humility, I will acknowledge that in every color, in every culture, in every class and in every capacity, there are beautiful, God-wrought gifts of common grace that when all said and done will be embraced by the people of God and celebrated by the people of God. And it's to that end we labor and fight to understand one another, love one another, and be gracious to one another. This is what the Imago Dei and an understanding should do in our hearts. And so in the weeks ahead, we're going to consider this. We're going to consider how the Imago Dei shapes our views on race, on life, and on the unreached peoples uh, of the world. We're also going to look at how sin perverts our understanding of the Imago Dei and really makes a mess uh, of all of this. I, I would say that all the truly deplorable acts of mankind throughout history can all be traced back to a fundamental flaw in understanding the Imago Dei. It's a, um, it's in a prescription to um, the Babylonian Assyrian um, creation narrative that says all of this is about power and domain and violence and therefore human values on a sliding scale. But it's the God of the Bible that says, no, 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 all human life is valuable regardless done. In fact, so valuable is it that, that the most incapacitated special needs adult who will never be able to contribute anything and will need to be watched over all the days of his life is more valuable than the most expensive racehorse imaginable. This is what it means to grab hold of the Imago Dei. So I thought in light of this being a month of prayer, we would just spend a moment or two here at the end praying. And then um, I'll, I'll close us out here in a bit. We've got two prayer points. And then as I close us out, the men and women are going to serve communion. They're going to head and, and grab the elements. And then we'll pass those out. At least here in Flower Mound, they might be doing it a little bit different at the other campuses. And then we'll experience the love of Christ by holding physically a piece of bread and holding physically a cup. And we'll rejoice in the presence of Christ in our midst. And so for now, let me lead you in just two points of prayer. Um, the first is I want to give you an opportunity to pray for a growing understanding of what it means to be made in the image of God. So you pray for you, that you would pray for a growing understanding of what it means to be made in the image of God. Maybe you, you treat yourself cheaply and what you need the Holy Spirit of God to do is to reveal that you shouldn't be treating yourself cheaply, that you have value and worth as you alone are among those who have been made in the image of God.
want to invite you into the courage that will be required to pray that the Spirit of God would expose where you might think of certain people or peoples as less than. Maybe that's a class of people you think are less than. Maybe that's a color of people. Maybe that's another culture. Or, or maybe it's those that have different capacity, less capacity than you. Just the Spirit of God to reveal those places in your heart where you believe that others are less than. Most of us don't think these spaces are there takes an incident or a crisis to reveal those dark places in our hearts. Maybe in the quietness of this moment, the Spirit might reveal that to you. Father, as we close out our time of prayer this morning, our time of considering you, creator of all who have made us in your image, as we close out this time of looking at your word and crying out to you for help, we ask once again that you would move for your glory and our joy, that you would give us eyes to see people as you see people. That even as we leave here, those who maybe will serve us at lunch or those um, who, who are um, working around us, our peers, our co-workers, those we work for, those we work with, that we would learn to see others as you see them. And that being rooted and grounded in love, our default operating mode being one of love, that we might be a part of dispensing your love to others. I pray for my brothers and sisters here who are in a season of deconstruction and they feel it. They are being undone and broken apart through uh, various trials and difficulties. I, I thank you that when you reconstruct and you always reconstruct, that it'll be a more beautiful us than exists now in this deconstruction. It will house more of your fullness, more of your beauty, more of your glory. And so we thank you and we ask that you would strengthen us in the middle of this process. We thank you that you have not abandoned us nor forgotten us. Give us eyes to see others as you see them. It's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen.